Welcome to As a Woman, Fertility Hormones and Beyond. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford, and I am a board-certified OBGYN and fertility physician and also co-founder of Fora Fertility in Austin, Texas. Each week on this podcast, I discuss health and fertility and how they relate to your true self. Become a part of the community of collaboration that amplifies others as a woman. I hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, friends, and welcome back to the As a Woman podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Natalie Crawford. Today, we are answering your fertility questions, and this episode is all about endometriosis. I always think it's so important to answer your questions, and voicemail questions are my favorite. So this is one of my very, very favorite episodes. You can call 657-229-3672 to leave your own voicemail, and I would love to get to that question. We've gotten so many great voicemails, and the thing I love is sometimes you don't know what questions you have until somebody else asks them. So we're going to jump in and go through some of your questions in just a minute. You can also ask questions on Instagram every Monday at Natalie Crawford MD. We will answer questions right on Instagram, in the newsletter, and in other podcast episodes. The newsletter comes out every week, has updates, recipes, just keeps you in the loop, things that I like, and some new exciting events. We also have a TTC starter kit, which is just the top tips compiled all together if you're trying to get pregnant or you want to get pregnant soon. So you can sign up for that at nataliecrawfordmd.com slash newsletter. Also, while you're on the website, two things to know. Number one is that we have our fertility courses. There's the Enhance Your Natural Fertility course, all about lifestyle optimization. And there's a nice community where I go and answer your questions. And number two is going to be the IVF guide. If you're going to do IVF, has all information about protocols, red flags, questions to ask, trying to help you have success no matter what clinic you might be seeing. And if you're doing IVF, both of them are absolutely your best bet. The other thing to know on the website is that there's a resources page and there is a search bar at the top friends. So you can put in whatever question you have and you can search and see all the content, whether it's a podcast, a YouTube, a blog post, anything that exists pertaining to that topic. So whether it is endometriosis or PCOS or IVF, you can find an easier way to sort through all the years of content that we have. Endometriosis is one of those topics that is controversial and I'm not really sure why. I think it's because for a long time, women had to fight so hard to get diagnosed. And even still today, there was so much dismissive medical treatment, gaslighting by medical providers, not believing that your pain or your symptoms were real or had merit, that it put so many people in a position of defensiveness and honestly being much behind the game when it came to their health, their fertility. But anytime I talk about endometriosis, it always seems like some people get mad and I'm just going to come out and say 100% not my goal. I'm a fertility doctor. I talk about endometriosis in the context of what is going to be the best option for you to get pregnant now or in the future. Those may not be your goals. And endometriosis, there's many different treatments based on what your goals are. So your goals and my patient's goals might be different. So understand that often there are other options depending on what your goal is. And so that is number one, the most important point. What is your goal? And you have to know that before you can tell it to somebody else. If you're done with your family, if you never want kids, if you know you want kids, if you're actively trying for kids, absolutely different things should be done in all of those scenarios. And I think that information is really important for you to know and for your doctor. If you get red flags, if you're not trusting your care team, you should get a second opinion. I know it's not easy to do. You have to send records or gather things or have tests redone or travel. But at the end of the day, it's your health, your body, and you're the one responsible for making sure that you are controlling the things you can't control. Endometriosis is an inflammatory condition on the autoimmune spectrum. And what essentially happens is your body has an abnormal reaction to a normal process. In everybody, we We know that some of the endometrial cells can be found outside the uterus when you have a period. That makes logical sense. Your uterus is cramping, the endometrium is shutting, the pathway of least resistance for most of the cells is the cervix, but if you have open fallopian tubes, some of those cells can go out the fallopian tubes. Now, it's not just the presence of those cells and it's not those cells themselves that cause the problem, but your body views them as foreign. This is the immune reaction component, attacks them, and then these cells develop into implants of tissue that is endometrial-like. 
It's not exactly the endometrium and it has a lot of hormonal responsiveness. So what we know is that that tissue can be very sensitive to estrogen and progesterone, just like the endometrium can. It grows in response to estrogen. No, it should be compressed by progesterone, but there's been studies showing that progesterone resistance in that tissue might be a part of the problem or that might develop in some people. But what we know without a doubt is that it causes a lot of inflammation, that women who have endometrium it's higher in families, it puts you at risk for other autoimmune conditions, and that you develop chronic inflammation, which can turn into scar. And despite the fact that it has many different stages, you can have infertility at all of them. You can have no symptoms and have endometriosis. You can have severe symptoms and be diagnosed with mild endometriosis. The degree of symptoms is not reflected in your clinical diagnosis. And to make matters worse, it's hard to diagnose. It's a surgical diagnosis, and we're not always willing or wanting, or it's not always in our best interest to have surgery. So although sometimes we can get to a diagnosis with other modalities like ultrasound, having a normal ultrasound does not mean you don't have endo. That was an opening explanation to understand that endometriosis is at its heart an abnormal immune reaction associated with chronic inflammation, has a severe impact on your fertility, and we think 40 to 50% of patients with unexplained infertility have undiagnosed endometriosis. So let's hear some of your questions, and you can always call and leave a question at 657-229-3672. Hey, my name's Taylor. I'm 29, um, and my question is, I got diagnosed with endometriosis at 15. I had a endometrioma rupture in my left ovary, which I realized that kind of stinks to happen at such a young age, but I got put on birth control, so I don't really remember what my periods have ever done. Um, I do have one son. I was only off of birth control for a few months and got pregnant with him. I was very lucky. But now we're wanting to try for baby number two. Hopefully get pregnant like in the next six months would be great. But I've been off of birth control for six and a half months now. And uh, my periods are not regular. They actually seem like they're trending longer and longer. My last cycle was 41 days. And I'm also tracking ovulation with my BBT, my LH, and my E3G, and I'm typically not ovulating. And when I do, my luteal phase is like eight days. So I was just wanting to see if you think it's reasonable to see my GYN, even though we haven't, like, started trying yet. Obviously, my body is not in sync, and there's something going on. So I just wanted to see what your thoughts would be about next steps. Thank you. You are absolutely right. Your body is not in sync. Things are not normal. You are not a normal patient, and it's so reasonable to go get an evaluation for a couple different reasons. Number one, for everybody who doesn't know, an endometrioma represents late or severe endometriosis. What has happened is that when you ovulated, some of those endometrial-like cells got into the ovary, loved that follicle and all the good blood supply, and formed a cyst called an endometrioma. These can be very painful, they can get bigger, they can destroy your ovarian tissue, they can rupture, and as we said, it's very inflammatory. So I'm so sorry you went through that, and we know your endo was severe even at such a young age. Going on birth control right away was helpful for a couple different reasons. Number one, anybody who has cysts, birth control prevents you from ovulating and the origin of many cysts, follicular cysts or endometriomas, all stem from ovulating. So if you don't ovulate, you're not going to have that potential risk of getting the cyst. Number two, Number two, because the endometrial tissue, the endometriosis, is stimulated by estrogen, non-ovulating prevents you from having that unopposed estrogen stimulus. Even though the birth control pill has ethanol estradiol in it, it is different. It doesn't cause the same growth of endometrium like estradiol made by your ovaries does. And when you take the birth control pill, you're also taking progesterone at the same time to counter that estrogen. Think about estrogen as a growth factor and a progesterone as a slow factor or a preventing growth factor. So those two together are preventing this big hormonal response in the endometriosis. So being on birth control, stopping it and getting pregnant 
in close proximity is actually quite common for a lot of people with endometriosis because the inflammation has been at bay, it hasn't gotten worse, and it prevented you from having more endometriomas. Now though, you've been off the pill and we're getting older and a lot of different things can happen. One thing is that you're noticing your periods are becoming irregular. They're longer, your hormones are off. That is completely separate from endo. So number one, endometriosis is not associated with irregularity of your periods. It can cause pain, it can cause spotting, it can cause GI issues, but it doesn't cause irregular cycles because that's a hormonal-based communication between brain and ovary. There's many reasons why thyroid disease, and in fact, women with endometriosis have that higher rate of thyroid disease. You can, it can be associated with age or ovarian reserve or PCOS or your body weight. Many things control ovulation. So you don't have to try any amount of time if things are not normal. So if you're not ovulating and you're not having regular cycles, you're right. Go to the doctor, figure out why, see if something can be done. Because that is the prerequisite to try to conceive. Have normal cycles, know that you're ovulating. Then you start trying to conceive for six months or a year pending your age. I also want to highlight that with your history of endometriosis, I never recommend people go the full year of trying to get pregnant, even if they're young. Remember, based on your age, your chances of fertility is going to be different. But if you are young, let's say you're 33 and younger, you should have a 20 to 25% chance of getting pregnant per month. So if you're not pregnant and six months have gone by, it's reasonable to go get an evaluation, especially with that history. I'm seeing more women come in who had bad endo, a bad surgery, and we're doing a fertility evaluation from the get-go because you have a higher risk of abnormal anatomy, a higher risk of low ovarian reserve because of the endo, and a higher risk as of associated conditions that can impact your fertility like thyroid disease. So you have two reasons that warrant an evaluation right away, your endo history, your new onset abnormal periods. You could go see an OBGYN or a fertility doctor to try to start getting to the bottom of what is going on. All right, moving on to our next question. Hi, Natalie. My name is Lindsay. I'm a 36-year-old and I have been trying to conceive for about a year and a half and I have unexplained infertility. But ever since I got my period when I was 16, I experienced really terrible pain on the first day where I would, sorry, it's a lot of information, but I would vomit and get really like dizzy and lightheaded. And my gyno put me on birth control and that helped and I was prescribed naproxen. So now years later, I'm trying to conceive and my doctor now thinks I have possible endometriosis, but all of the testing is negative. They don't see any endometriosis in the, I guess, tract where sperm or eggs can move. But my question is, can I have endometriosis and it not be in the tract? Can it still affect my fertility if I have swelling or whatever it might be? I just have a question about that. Thanks. Bye. These are really common questions and do underscore how confusing endometriosis is and how hard it can be to get to a diagnosis leading to not knowing what to do about your body. First of all, a lot of people have cramps when you have a period. Cramping is normal. It's caused by prostaglandins and it's a normal process by which you have contraction of the uterine musculature in order to help period blood be expelled. Period pain that is so severe that it impacts your quality of life, especially when you are an adolescent and this period pain is keeping you home from school, but also activities. You're not going out to pizza with friends or to the movies or playing sports. You're vomiting or passing out. All of those are not normal things, and a high concern for endometriosis should be there, and it was. So when it comes to adolescents that have severe pelvic pain, which interrupts their quality of life if they go to surgery, one study showed up to 75% would have endometriosis. Granted, this is pain bad enough to get you to surgery, but one would argue that you would qualify for this. And birth control pills can help control some of the symptoms, as we talked about. Having both estrogen and progesterone can 
prevent rapid growth, inflammation, and huge hormonal fluctuations. It's not going to get rid of the endometriosis. That is not how hormones work. But it did seem like it drastically improved your quality of life and hopefully helped keep some endometriosis at bay. What's hard now is that trying to get to the diagnosis when you're having unexplained infertility. Since a high percentage of patients with unexplained infertility have endo, it could be helpful to get to this diagnosis. That being said, are we going to do surgery to get there? And that's the big question. And I have this talk with my patients all the time, and it is really patient dependent on your goals and your age and many, many factors. When we want to diagnose endometriosis, it sounds like they did maybe an HSG test, a hysterosalpingogram, or some x-ray-based test or a sonography with water where essentially we put liquid into the tract, the reproductive tract, the uterus, and then into the fallopian tubes to check for blockage. Classically, yes, a very obvious connecting branch between having endo and having infertility is if you have anatomical distortion. But as we said in the introduction, the simple presence of this abnormal response to the endometrial tissue causes inflammation, and that inflammation does harm. I like to think about it as toxic to the uterine environment, toxic to eggs, sperm, fertilization, embryo transport, division, implantation, the whole stage of early reproductive development. And yes, inflammation, when it's there for a long time can lead to scarring. And that's what we can check with a sonohistogram, FMVU, and HSG. But a normal anatomical evaluation does not tell us you don't have endo. It just tells us you don't have it so bad that your tubes aren't blocked. But it doesn't tell us anything about earlier stage disease. Similarly, an ultrasound. Sometimes on an ultrasound, we can see an endometrioma, one of those endometriosis cysts. And I can tell somebody, you have endometriosis. But you might have a normal ultrasound and you very well can still have endometriosis. Sometimes we go to surgery. So this will depend on age, reproductive goals, severity of symptoms. Going to surgery, it's a laparoscopic surgery, camera through the belly button, it's getting you a diagnosis. So you're going to come out of surgery and know for sure if you have it. You also can excise or ablate some of these areas. Most people are excising, but we're not going to get into that discussion here. You can remove or destroy the areas of endometriosis implants, and this will decrease your inflammatory load. However, it's an autoimmune disease. Presuming you're still going to have periods at some point, if you're trying to conceive, it is going to come back. And so you do see often an improvement of fertility after surgery for a very short amount of time. So this does depend on how old you are, how the sperm is, what's your ovarian reserve, how many kids you want, because it might not make sense in context of your reproductive goals. And very often with my patients, I say, presumed endometriosis. And we talk about pros and cons for treatment options without ever going and getting that diagnosis because it doesn't make sense for them in their scenario. Important things about surgery for diagnosis. Some people go in without much pain and they leave with pain because excising the tissue, you can have scarring form. That's not a benign process. Any surgery does have risks. It doesn't mean you don't do it, but it just means full picture. Is that surgery worth it for us? I think often people have a hard time connecting why earlier stage disease, so you have chronic inflammation, why that's really making it hard for you to get pregnant. And the easiest way for me to describe this is to bridge inflammation and pregnancy. The inflammatory process is a normal process. Acute inflammation helps your body heal from a cut. It's very important. When you ovulate, inflammation is crucial. And that makes sense. A follicle is rupturing, an egg is coming out, and it has to reheal. So the acute inflammatory response is essential. Chronic inflammation is that inflammation that never goes away. And I like to think about that as toxic. And if I treat inflammation, they're treated the same. So if you come in and you take a bunch of anti-inflammatories, like NSAIDs such as Motrin or Advil or Leave during your whole cycle, you might prevent your own ovulation because inflammation is important in that ovulatory process. So we can't fully treat the inflammation and still ovulate. Now, of course, we can decrease inflammation with surgery. There's lifestyle modifications that we can do to improve our overall inflammatory burden. And sometimes patients will need IVF because in IVF, I can take the eggs out of your body. I can then treat that inflammation down, 
and then put an embryo back inside in a non-inflammatory environment. And I've really changed the environment that fertilization and early embryo growth happens because that IVF lab doesn't have any inflammation. And then I can change the uterine environment before I put an embryo back in. To answer the question, you can have an absolutely normal imaging, normal physical exam, normal ultrasound, normal reproductive tract imaging with HSG or other type of evaluation, and you can still have endometriosis and that endo can absolutely still be significant. Based on your history from when you were a teenager, I share your concern. I do think you have a very high chance of having endometriosis. All right, moving on to the next question now. And as a reminder, if you want to call and leave a voicemail, you can call 657-229-3672. Hi, Dr. Crawford. Thank you so much for always answering our questions. So my question is, well, a little backstory. If we go back to my the beginning of my fertility journey, I was diagnosed with PCOS um, after IUIs and time intercourse. We had one miscarriage, tried again, and it wasn't working, so we decided to go into IVF. After one cell frozen embryo transfer, we had them genetically tested, so we know it was genetically normal. We had a failed transfer, so we decided to go for further testing. We got, I think they called it the BCL6 biopsy, showing that I have now endometriosis. So we're looking at some treatment options for endometriosis before we do transfer number two. Um, I've been given the option of surgery or several months of a shot called Lupron Depot mixed with a couple other hormonal medications. My question would be, what is the best route? Um, you know, my doctor tells me that it's up to me, but I'm, I'm just at a loss. Like, is surgery better or the medication? There's just not a lot of research about the medication. Um, so if you could give me your insight, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much. I'm so sorry this journey has been harder than we were hoping it would be, but hopefully you are getting some answers and can get to that next stage. Number one is that anytime we have a suspicion for endo, unexplained infertility, I treat all of my unexplained like an endometriosis or an autoimmune patient. So I'm very familiar with a Lupron-based suppression prior to an embryo transfer. And there's a few different ways to do it. You can do microdose Lupron and overlap it with some birth control pills. If you are really trying to change the environment, you can do two months of the Depo Lupron. Depo just means intramuscular injection. It lasts longer, typically for 30 days. So instead of a daily shot, it's more like a one-time injection. And we even go further than that to change the environment with two months of Depolupron plus an aromatase inhibitor called Letrozole. And that option has been studied the most in settings like yours. Surgery was previously the gold standard. We had success rates normally, success rates with endo without surgery, success rates with endo with surgery. And Lupron suppression has changed the game and really made it no different than if you went through surgery. So to me, I'm actually changing the environment with Lupron and Lupron and or Letrozole, pending what your doctor is recommending. For surgery, I'm changing the environment if it's done right. So that's really dependent on the doctor, your anatomy, how things look. And as I said in the last question, if you don't have bad pain, you might risk coming out of surgery and now having bad pain. When I have this discussion with patients, if your pain is debilitating, if it's impacting your quality of life, then we can easily see that there's a benefit to the surgery. And if we come out of the surgery and for some reason, not all of the endometriosis was able to be removed, we still have the option to add on some longer Lupron suppression. That is what fewer of my patients are choosing, probably because of time, cost, risks with surgery. And most of them, removal of pain is not their primary goal. Getting pregnant is. And so it makes more sense to use Lupron. This is a personal choice. I wish your doctor would give you a little more guidance on why one might be better suited for you. I'm a huge fan of Lupron. I really like Lupron and Letrozole if we've got recurrent implantation failure, which you officially don't have based on the criteria. 
None of the choices are wrong, but there's probably one that's more in line with your goals. For me, I want to know that I'm really tampering down all that inflammation and I've seen great results with patients who we are suppressing with Lupron beforehand. I will say Lupron gets a really bad reputation. Back when girls were younger and you'd have this big end of surgery as a teenager and you'd come out of it, people would try to suppress your ovulation so the endo wouldn't come back. And they put girls on Lupron for a very, very long time. You'll hear people say, well, Lupron causes medical menopause. Not exactly, but I see why they say it. It causes a hyperestrogenic state, meaning the brain is no longer sending out FSH or LH, so the ovaries are not growing a follicle or making estrogen. In that state for a prolonged period of time, you're going to feel bad because your body wants estrogen. In the context of where we are, you'll be taking it for a couple months. You'll then go on estrogen. You're then going to get pregnant. We're not worried about long-term risks with Lupron, but they are a concern if somebody's getting put on this medication, not for fertility, but for medical management of endometriosis, and they're planning to be on it for a very long time without any add-back hormonal therapy. We're worried about your bone health, your mental health, and there's a big conversation about what you should do in that scenario. Hi, Natalie. I was just reaching out because I've been listening to your podcast and it's been really informative and great, so I appreciate all you're doing with that. Um, I just had a question. I'm 27, and I had a second trimester loss, but I had no complications from the birth. And it's been about 12 cycles, and I've been getting some fertility testing, and I just finished a natural monitoring cycle with no medications just to see what my body is doing. So far, I have a very high AFC, AMH. My AMH was 6.3. On the ultrasound, they could clearly see I was ovulating and my lining was good. My cycles are regular and they can't really find anything wrong. I haven't gotten an HSD yet, though, so that's something I might do in the future. But I guess my question was my concern around silent endometriosis and If you had any information on that, Uh, I don't really have any pain except mild cramping before my period, but how can I know that this is impacting my fertility if you can't get any symptoms and the only way to diagnose is with surgery? And since I am young and have been trying for about a year, what next steps make the most sense in this situation? You've really asked the right question because how do you know if you have silent endo? By definition, that means you don't have any symptoms. And I suppose infertility is the only symptom. Classic symptoms of endometriosis include pain with intercourse, painful periods, pelvic pain that's chronic or in the same area for most of your cycle. You might have pain with urination or bowel movements. Many people have GI issues, especially around the time of their period, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, and then infertility. So these are all the symptoms that we really see with endo. We see an increased prevalence in families. So if mom, sister, aunt had endo, we see an increased prevalence in people who have autoimmune disease or autoimmune in their family. If somebody's got Hashimoto's or celiac, then we have a higher likelihood this could be a play also. Certainly when we look at the category of unexplained infertility, there's a higher prevalence of endometriosis there. So what can you do? You're young, you've been trying for a year, maybe you don't necessarily want to do surgery, and I wouldn't recommend it if you're asymptomatic for reasons stated earlier. Make sure all the testing is complete, right? Sounds like you're ovulating, you've got a good AMH, you know, make sure sperm's been checked, make sure the tubes have been checked so we can get the HSG done, make sure the tubes are fine. With all of that, you're you're filtering into an unexplained infertility group that I would, in my brain, maybe you have endo, maybe you don't, depends on those family risk factors. The pathways don't end up being that different, meaning your treatment options are going to include super ovulation with IUI as one option, and then IVF as the other. Certainly, if we know you have endo, IVF is preferred, so that would be an advantage. But If you're young or if you don't have the financial resources or if you're not quite ready for IVF and you're not going to do that anyway, trying ovulation induction with IUI or just trying a little bit longer, presuming your tubes are open and all the testing is fine, can make a lot of sense too. 
If you think you have it based on symptoms, when you really think about it or we talk to our family, then I, as said, will label people presumed endo and just make sure I'm giving them transfer protocols and I'm counseling them right. But silent endo or asymptomatic endo is tough. We know that people can have severe disease and no symptoms. So surgery is the only way to really answer the question. But I agree, in the absence of pain, I'm not sure that it is going to be worth going through the risk of surgery. But now it might for you. Maybe everything else is normal. You want to know the answer. It changes what you might do for your future. So there's a lot of nuance and everybody's going to be different. So this is 100% a conversation I would have with a doctor who I trust, who operates and does endo and really get their opinion. Overall, wishing you the best and you're asking great questions. All right, well, thank you guys so much for all of your support, leaving these questions. It's amazing. If you want to leave your own question, you can call 657-229-3672. You can also leave questions on the Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD on Monday. Those questions will be answered on the podcast, on Instagram, and in the weekly newsletter. Sign up for the weekly newsletter at Natalie Crawford MD slash newsletter. You will get the TTC starter guide with lots of lifestyle and cycle tracking information. There's also the resources tab on the website. So don't forget to check it out. It has a search bar so you can type in endometriosis. And don't forget to learn more about the Enhance Your Natural Fertility course and the IVF guide. Thank you, friends. I love your questions. Please call and ask more. Thank you. Thank you all for listening to As a Woman. It would mean so much if you could rate, review, and follow the podcast to be notified of new episodes every Sunday. I hope you learned something new, and I hope you share it with someone in your life. Be sure to follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD and check out the YouTube channel Natalie Crawford MD. If you're interested in becoming a patient, you can also follow Fora Fertility. I'm so thrilled to have you here, part of the community that amplifies others as a woman. <laughs>